Australia has its own challenges and beating inflation is one of those and trying to make certain you don't get a wages price spiral well, that's vital. The latest quarterly inflation number, well, that's out tomorrow with market forecasts suggesting the annual rate will drop from 7.8 to 6.9%. But how will that sway the RBA? Ben Pictaman is the Senior Strategist for Global Economics and Markets with Rabobank and joins me now. Ben, many thanks for your time. Pleasure. Um, this inflation number is important, but so too are the wages numbers that are going to come out because you don't want one leaking into the other. That's the key, isn't it? That is the key, Ross. And, um, and I guess what we're, what we're seeing recently is that uh, wages just aren't keeping up with prices. So this, this number that comes out tomorrow is the, the next iteration of the data in that sense, and, uh, and we'll see what the gap is. OK, so just explain this, because supply and demand says that if you have a lack of workers, wages should go up, but they're not. So, therefore, everybody sits there and goes, well, hang on. So, you've got unions, you've even got politicians, Labor politicians, pushing for more wage rises, noting that real wages are not going up while the, way, while the inflation is. I is something broken here? Well, I, I would just push back a little bit on the idea that, uh, that wages aren't going up, because they are. They're actually going up at the fastest rate in 10 years, but they're not going up as fast as prices. So, because we've seen this enormous explosion in prices, wages just haven't been keeping up. And, and the problem here is that uh, labour markets, they tend to be very sticky. They're, they're slow to react. They take longer than prices. And that's what we're seeing. So even though things are starting to pick up, they're not picking up fast enough and we haven't kept pace with what's happening in prices. But, OK, even the RBA review goes to the whole notion of full employment. Where is it? The Treasurer sort of last week indicated it's low fours, maybe four and a quarter percent. The Reserve Bank isn't quite so prescriptive, it says, somewhere. But it's three and a half percent, the unemployment rate. So supply and demand says that wages growth should be faster than it is. Yeah. So that's why something has changed. That's what you're almost trying to get to here, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So we do think that something's changed, uh, but something might be changing again. So we, we've come through this very long period of the last 40 years or so where the labour market is becoming more efficient. We're deregulating throughout this period, uh, all the way through the Hawke-Keating-Howard years. Uh, and, and what we think has happened is we've sort of hit this, uh, I, I guess, the, the peak of the crest uh, in, the, in the 2010s where the labour market got as, uh, as deregulated as it was ever going to be. And what we think is happening now is we're, we're in a new period where we're starting to see re-regulation of the labour market. And you can see that from where the Labor government is going to, where it wants industry-wide bargaining rather than individual bargaining in workplaces. Yeah, that's right. So we've already seen a few initiatives from Tony Burke and Anthony Albanese on this. Uh, there's more to come. They've already said that uh, there's there's more IR bills that we will be brought before the parliament on uh, same same work, same. But pay. that's trying to drive wages higher. But that's trying to address the inflation issue. But what happens on the ground is that many people who can't keep up simply go and drive Uber or rent their house out for Airbnb. They enter the gig economy to raise the money that they need to well pay the bills and keep the mortgage paid as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a new feature of the labour market. It's only really been around since about 2012, the gig economy. And, you know, I caught an Uber on the way over here. That, that didn't exist not that long ago. We had to catch a taxi or, or drive in ourselves or catch public transport. But uh, what we're finding is that uh, that, that creates efficiencies in the labour market. So uh, th these, these new ways of working are actually sort of creating jobs for people that maybe wouldn't have existed in the past. And that's allowed unemployment rate to get down as low as it is now, below what the full employment level is, according to the Reserve Bank and Treasury. OK, there's another aspect of this, and that is the female participation rate is as high as it's ever been. Now, that's brilliant because you're not wasting educated people. It means that families have now got two incomes, flexibility of work, working from home. This allows people to earn an income and yet have the flexibility of raising a family. So these are good things. But if you've got two people with incomes, maybe the pressure's off for them to push as aggressively as they might have once done to get a pay rise. Yeah, maybe that's true, but I, I might push back on that a little bit too, Ross, because yeah. uh, an, another thing that I think we, we all know is a bit of a feature now is that it, it takes two incomes to do the same sort of thing that one income used to get you in, in the past. Well, see, that's the reason, even the reason why it's either a couple working together or one person has two or even three jobs. And as you know from the stats, the, the number of people with more than one job in our economy is the highest also that it's ever been. So you've got the highest female participation rate and the highest number of people ever that we've had who have actually got more than one job. 
Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting situation. So, you know, the labour market looks extremely strong when we, when we look at all of these indicators for unemployment, underemployment, participation rates. Uh, but, you know, there, there are some soft patches when you delve into the detail. That's one of them. The wages situation is another. But then you've got the inflation number that comes down tomorrow. As I said, 6.8% is the forecast. The Reserve Bank is watching that, um, as everybody's watching it, to see whether there's enough of a fall in that inflation rate to justify having kept interest rates on hold and whether it does so into the coming months. Yeah, that's a, a good observation. I, I think uh, the, the Reserve Bank here in Australia has been desperate to keep interest rates on hold. They've, they've copped a lot of political heat over, over rate increases. And really, they're the most dovish central bank out of all the G10 central banks. There's so, no doubt about that. That's absolutely true, right? Yeah, that is true. And, uh, and we, we think that what's probably going to happen is that uh, they'll be looking for a justification tomorrow to keep rates on hold. But if this number comes in really hot, we had a very strong labour market number a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, it might be back to hike town for the RBA. And the one little thing, just very briefly, is oil prices. Jumping back above $80 US a barrel, that's inflationary. It is inflationary, and, and we had OPEC announcing some fairly heavy production cuts a few weeks ago as well. So these sorts of supply shocks, um, the RBA and Treasury have said, are going to be a fact of life in the future. So, you know, we can just expect these to keep happening um, and, you know, these supply chain issues are, are going to push prices higher. There you go. Ben Picton from Arabo Bank. Many thanks for your time today. Thanks, Ross. Pleasure. There you go.